Hi. I felt that the first video that I made, a vlog, in effect, on the uh, paper, which is a new section or chapter of the uh, Manual of Revolution being produced by the Jewish Blindus Diaspora Movement, uh, of which I am the uh, chairman of the revolution. The first part dealt with basically an introduction, you know, to the necessity of the topic of social orders. Because we have seen that there is a, a frozen revolutionary process in the first world countries that have suffered uh, various defeats. And we have also seen during the Second World War the degeneration of uh, the working class consciousness to be taken over by the uh, Nazi program, which called itself National Socialist, of course, in order to secure the support of the proletariat. It was a proletarian movement, which instead of seeking to overthrow the capitalist relations of productions and liberate the workers, offered a better deal supposedly to the German working class by uh, pretending that it was going to secure Lebensraum, that is a living space. What does that mean? It means that the uh, German working class was corrupted by the Nazi movement to believe that it had inherent rights above that of uh, any other uh, national culture and above that of the uh, national minorities living within to be a Christian nation state which sought to uh, take over the lands, expel or exterminate the peoples uh, therein in order to make uh, plantations basically in a feudal system whereby the German working class would become a landed aristocracy or landed uh, peasantry which had at its disposal the slaves of the Slav nations, that's how they originally got their name, and uh, with the elimination of the Jewish people who were the cause of all the problems supposedly. That was the program of the National Socialist Movement which was successful in capturing the fidelity of the uh, German working class, unfortunately. Which puts into question the consciousness of the working class itself in the first world countries. So, we have to go into a further examination of the problematic. The problematic being how to achieve socialist revolution in the first world countries. So I have a couple of excerpts here from the, uh, from the paper on uh, cleavage points, uh, social orders and class. And I have some addition, uh, additional remarks that I've codified here, which uh, I, will, uh, I will read to you, with commentary, of course. Now, when, where then does that leave us in the Jewish Socialist Bund, which has emerged from the ashes of history to present the program necessary to provide an alternative to the racist nation state in both the USA and in Palestine. Uh, it's a bit sensitive, you know, as a topic. Uh, I've never really become a Holocaust survivor uh, historian because it's too stressful to deal with uh, the Holocaust and the, uh, the defeat that uh, it exemplifies. So, nonetheless, we of the Jewish Socialist Bund uh, together with uh, myself as a second generation Holocaust survivor and, uh, and Bundist by origin, uh, by way of my mother who was a Jewish Bundist in the uh, movement in uh, the Warsaw ghetto. And before that, you know, in the, the city of Warsaw in Poland, where uh, about 35% of the population was Jewish itself, most of whom were Jewish Bundists, that is socialists. Now, we have emerged from the ashes of history, contrary to the belief of the Zionists, which consider that the Bund no longer exists, uh, uh, alongside of the Marxists, who believe the same thing, that the Bund no longer exists, exists and is no longer relevant, except as a historical antidote uh, to the uh, Zionist ideology, but without implementing the actual program of the Bund which is a contradiction in itself, but uh, 
that's another topic. That topic being uh, the uh, sectarian Marxist tendencies that refuse to recognize the existence of a Jewish political culture and a Jewish people who are an oppressed nation. However, we're able to form a united front by way of the concept of national cultural autonomy, whereby no one national formation controls any other, other than itself. This communalist convergence uh, is beyond uh, the political doctrine of liberal electoral politics and beyond the Leninist party mini-state formation that seeks to replace the dictatorship of one class by that of another by means of the uh, party paradigm. It is rather the state that is put into question and is thus undermined uh, by the rejection of the nation-state with the negation of the state itself by and on behalf of civil society. Yes, civil society, which has been referred to by Hegel and by Gramsci, but never sort of, you know, according it, you know, the necessary political uh, significance and independence that it requires. So, I refer to the communalist convergence, which you've probably never heard about before, except if you've read the uh, writings of uh, Dr. Huey P. Newton. Uh, yes, uh, Huey Newton was a, a PhD who uh, took uh, the study of revolutionary politics seriously and is necessary to pursue further studies in this way, in an academic way, in a systematic way, in a, a professional way, in order to be successful. So he projected communalism as a, a political methodology based uh, by origin on the Paris Commune, no doubt, but uh, one which uh, is uh, beyond or aside, you know, the uh, ideology of uh, communism, which is uh, so directly linked, you know, with the party mini-state formation and which prevents the uh, liberation and the independence of civil society. Now, to continue with an excerpt here from the paper, the struggle against Christian supremacism, otherwise called white supremacism, is a struggle against Zionist indoctrination amongst the Jewish people, and is not a struggle against Jewish supremacism per se, since the Zionist state only exists by means of the colonial Occidental impulse, and is not a campaign for Jewish supremacism per se. It is an escapist mechanism subordinate to the uh, Christian supremacist crusade that it operates on behalf. So, you know, like in the past, you know, the Christian crusades have not been successful in uh, occupying and penetrating the uh, Orient, and now a new mechanism has been found. Despite, you know, the occupation of Jerusalem in 1917 by the British occupation under the leadership of General Allenby, who declared the, the occupation of Jerusalem to be the last crusade, as if it was going to be permanent, it wasn't. It was expelled, you know, by both the Palestinian resistance and by the Zionist militias, which took over in place of the British occupation with the complicity of the British imperial intent, which uh, provided uh, uh, arms and uh, the freedom to operate uh, on behalf of the Zionist militias, which took over the territory on behalf of the Occidental world. That is the first world. The struggle against Zionism is thus the opposition to assimilation in the Christian nation-state paradigm. It is assimilation which is proposed, theorized, as a liberation mechanism by Marxism for the uh, Jewish people as a social order. But, you know, really, examine, you know, the, uh, the actuality of uh, the German uh, political culture, which uh, initially allowed for the assimilation of the, the Jewish-German uh, uh, political culture to a great extent, but which uh, evidently failed. And it should have been known that it was going to be failed, you know, because it was uh, attempted previously, you know, in the, in the Spanish, you know, like uh, metropolis of the Spanish Empire, which allowed 
for a certain degree of uh, Jewish uh, assimilation by way of conversion, conversion to uh, uh, Catholicism. And there were many Jewish people who did convert to Catholicism because, you know, they wanted to have, you know, the, the freedom to uh, assimilate into the higher social orders uh, and uh, into the professional castes in service of the state. But with the uh, uh, regime of the Isabella and Ferdinand in uh, 1492, there was an expulsion of the Jewish and Muslim uh, political cultures and social orders. And those who had converted, the conversos, were the first to be subjected to, uh, ex uh, uh, subjected to, yes, to execution and uh, exile. So, you know, converting to uh, Christianity and Catholicism was no escape mechanism. It was no escape mechanism. So assimilation did not work in that context. It did not work in the German context either. And uh, for Marxism to propose assimilation again as a solution to the uh, oppression of the Jewish social order is, to say the least, uh, um, <laughs> unhistorical. To consider that Zionism is an ideology of Jewish supremacism is an act of political anti-Semitism, which places the origins of statism upon the Jewish political culture rather than Occidental imperialism. As a result, the Marxist opposition to Zionism, while late in coming, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Marxism supported Zionism to begin with, while late in coming, offers assimilation to the very political culture that inspires the ideology of Zionism itself. It was often said by the Marxists that I have worked with during the 60s and 70s, in particular the Trotskyists and uh, the anarchists, that anti-Semitism would disappear with the social revolution since the workers would no longer seek to blame the Jewish people as a conspiratorial bourgeoisie when the bourgeoisie was abolished. This thesis was based in the evaluation of the working class as the revolutionary class in the advanced capitalist economies. Now, as an alternative, we have some advanced Marxist political theory, which I would like to congratulate and uh, to adopt. Maoist third worldism is a valid theory since depending on the First World Proletariat, is a rather a minimalist uh, position. First of all, the proletariat is subject to the bourgeoisie as a willing wage slave that desires, first of all, and above all, a job as an individual. Uh, while the accumulation of capital is more advanced in capitalism as compared to feudalism, for the worker it represents a loss of security, actually, since the job is not permanent. The means of living are not necessarily provided by the main employer by way of wages, since the wage is not adequate. Next, the proletariat, according to classical Marxism, was only the industrial proletariat. The service sector of today is considered to be merely servants and not workers. The people working in the public sector do not count as well in Marxism, classical Marxism, since they do not potentially control the means of production or have the means to stop the means of production in general strike. Nowadays, as well, while previously, let's say, 3,000 workers ran an automobile factory, it is now 500 together with the automated machinery. And robots are not yet considered a working class. Furthermore, the first world workers are bought off, when necessary, with the super-exploitation of imperialism, as in the welfare state, which is now being drained of benefits. To agitate the first world proletariat, it would be necessary to cut off the neo-colonial sources of exploitation, as well as the needed resources. This is why third worldism is absolutely necessary. Notwithstanding the necessity 
of the Third World overthrow of capitalist neo-imperialism to generate the inevitable First World revolutions, it is nonetheless achievable in the advanced capitalist economies by way of the United Front of the social orders, which together form a majority of the given population. Consider the communalist convergence of the oppressed nationalities, Black Nation, Mexicas, First Nations, the Arab nations, Jewish people, the lumpen proletariat, the undocumented migrants as a particular genus, collection of peoples. This, together with the social orders of differing dimensions, such as the women's liberation movement, the various sexual liberation movements, the generational freedom culture, the cultural revolutions, etc., form a majority of the population which are quite capable of achieving a, an advanced socialist revolution in the first world. But this can only be achieved by the method of a united front, a communalist convergence. Now each social order struggling on its own would not be successful in itself other than achieving a, a few significant but limited reforms and which are reforms that are reversible given the, the counter-revolutionary reaction as exemplified in the case of the last four years under the Trump administration. So, any significant, any permanent revolution in the status of the oppressed social orders must necessarily achieve its objective by way of the United Front. And this is why the Jewish Bundist the diaspora movement is calling upon all the other social orders to unite together with their own program and achieve that which we are all seeking in a particular way, but to do so in a united front manner with a methodology that is capable of achieving that which is uh, necessary and that which each social order is setting out to do for itself. So, the paper itself is, um, is a much more systematic academic presentation, which is not something that is uh, to be left aside as, uh, as a uh, unnecessary burden upon the intellect. It's rather something that is an, a necessity, that is necessary to achieve a clarity of thought and precision of movement and action. This has uh, commonly been called a praxis, you know, the unity of struggle and, 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 uh, and theory. And uh, this is what uh, is, is really necessary. So I call upon you to um, have a look at the paper, which is now uploaded to my academic site and will be included in the Manual of Revolution, which will also be uploaded to my academic site under the name of Abraham Weisfeld. And uh, I sure... I, 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 I want to encourage you know, the younger generations of uh, revolutionary activists to maintain their activism as I have you know, until this late age of 72 years when I have uh, struggled on the streets of Montréal during the general uh, student strike, the un unlimited general strike of students which uh, occurred here in Montréal, Quebec and all of the region of Quebec during the 19, uh, 2012 uh, general strike that achieved its objective of uh, stopping the hike in student tuition fees so as to permit you know, the working class people and women in particular to gain access to university uh, academic education. So that here in Quebec now we have 20% of the working of the students you know, comprised of uh, working class students. And in, in some uh, faculties, even a majority of the students are women. So, as compared to Ontario, which has a much higher tuition fee rate, and only 10% of the student population are from the working class. So here, the 20% of the working class student population were able to achieve and led, you know, the general strike, which brought down the, uh, the provincial government of the Liberal Party, 
which was proposing a tuition fee increase, <laughs> and they didn't get away with it. And instead, you know, they gave up, called it a, an election, hoping to achieve a majority, you know, uh, government, and they failed to do so. And the uh, the uh, centrist uh, Quebecois uh, francophone nationalist party called the Parti Quebecois was elected instead. And because of the pressure of the social movement, which they correctly recognized and had led to their election, in the first day uh, there was a um, abrogation, that is a cancellation of the tuition fee increase, not bad, huh? and also a cancellation of a law which was meant to arrest all of the people who were demonstrating against the tuition fee increase, and which caused the street battles during which you know hundreds and hundreds of uh, demonstrators were arrested. And that law, law number 78, was also cancelled by the newly elected uh, Prime Minister of Quebec, who was the first woman to be elected Prime Minister of Quebec. And uh, there was even in the first day during her inaugural address an attempted assassination of her as well by uh, some kind of revolutionary, which was stopped by a uh, a, a technician who put his life on the line and was killed. This is not known because you know the English media doesn't like to report anything about Quebec that is favorable and so the Anglo English speaking you know uh, socialist uh, revolutionary left you know considers that uh, the Quebecois and liberation movement is represented by the right wing now, the centrist right wing Parti Québécois, which came up, you know, with various measures to cut back on social services and to propose a charter of values, which was meant to discriminate against the uh, Muslim population and anybody else who was not a Christian. Even while <laughs> it maintained, you know, the crucifix, you know, above the speaker's head in the National Assembly. <laughs> You know, like the, no bigger contradiction can be conceived of, actually. But since then, um, that party was discredited and had lost the next election and produced a, a even more right-wing nationalist uh, government in the form of the uh, CAQ. So, uh, we're looking forward you know, to uh, an alternative which is now exemplified by the uh, uh, Socialist Party, which is called Quebec Solidaire in Quebec. I'd like to promote uh, a certain sort of uh, alternative image of Quebec for the English-speaking uh, listeners now, so that they will know that there is a re revolution happening in Quebec because the Québécois are a social order and the press nationality within Canada, which was initially occupied by the British military and which also uh, carried out an expulsion of the uh, Francophone Acadian community in New Brunswick, which were expelled to um, Louisiana. And that's why New Orleans, you know, has a Francophone, you know, historical tradition. And why, you know, uh, Kerouac, who was a Francophone Quebecois living in the uh, Northeast United States and who continued to speak French, wrote in a uh, cultural liberation sense. The other uh, Francophone population which was oppressed by the British occupation and I'm talking about the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, who went out and um, suppressed uh, the rebellion of the Métis, who were the uh, mixed population, a new nation of Francophones and First Nations peoples. That is, you know, uh, French uh, men uh, who were fur trappers, went and, and got married, you know, with um, the uh, First Nations women to produce a new nation. And uh, they were oppressed. And, uh, uh, their leader was uh, was hung, as well as the uh, leaders of the rebellion of uh, 1837 in Quebec, which succeeded for a certain time, and was the um, uh, rebellion of both the uh, French and the Anglophone uh, Quebecois population, which uh, succeeded in various reforms and produced uh, a uh, Charter of Liberties, which was the first such Charter of uh, Personal Liberties here in Quebec, which was later adopted by Canada. But the leaders well, the bourgeois leaders, they were elected, you know, to become, you know, like, uh, you know, the uh, Liberal Party leaders and the uh, Liberal Quiet Revolution thereafter. But the revolutionary leaders were also hung 
by the British occupation of Canada, which is still called the Dominion of Canada, which is still basically a political colony of the, uh, of the United Kingdom of England uh, and has a governor general which is uh, chosen by the, uh, well, on the recommendation of the government of Canada, but is nonetheless, you know, affirmed by the Queen of England. Yes, Queen Elizabeth of England is still the uh, Queen of Canada and of Quebec, although she'll never dare set foot in Quebec. And uh, so we are a constitutional monarchy which needs to be abolished. So we look forward to a, a united front not only within the United States, not only within Canada, but we seek a united front of liberation in North America itself as a model for other continents as well. This gives rise to the thought and uh, the uh, references that have been made, you know, in previous political revolutionary theories to Pan-Africanism, Pan-Arabism, as in the Nasser sort, not in the Ba'athist uh, reactionary sort. And uh, in uh, China as well, we must also consider the uh, liberation struggles of the Muslim uh, social order there, which is subject to uh, cultural assimilation, but not subject to <laughs> the genocide, as is the slander propagated by many uh, of the Kuomintang, the Kaming KMT, you know, uh, which is found uh, in the various political tendencies uh, these days, which try to malign the uh, successes of the Chinese Revolution, which, in spite of the degeneration, under the various um, bureaucratic, uh, cast, bureaucratic uh, castes that have taken over the control of the Communist Party. Nonetheless, the Communist Party is still dynamic enough as a revolutionary force, despite its bourgeois members, to uh, uh, put down corruption and uh, actually successfully uh, overcome you know, the uh, extreme poverty that had existed in China previously due to the British occupation of previous centuries. And China has successfully overcome this uh, defeat in the past to demonstrate that it is only by socialist revolution in uh, 1949 that uh, China was able to achieve its national liberation and not by the uh, popular front that it uh, sought to achieve under the guidance of Stalin in 1937-38, uh, which led to the defeat of the Communist Party by the massacre propagated by the uh, Kuomintang, the, uh, national, uh, the national, bourgeois nationalist uh, party that was supported by the uh, Stalinist regime in order for its uh, geopolitical interests to forestall the uh, invasion by Japan with the help of the bourgeois nationalists of China which uh, didn't really work, you know, because uh, the Japanese imperialism uh, was still a threat and uh, which uh, was only defeated uh, uh, by the uh, Chinese uh, liberation of Manchuria in 1949. So there we have, you know, like uh, uh, pretty much a worldview, which I didn't expect to get into, but it really fits. United Front is uh, the methodology which is a revolutionary methodology and which uh, has a political program which can best now be described by the term communalist convergence and we invite you know all the social orders to uh, formulate their own political program and add it into the communalist convergence it is not for any other political source no political party can tell any social order what its political program should be. This is an autonomous uh, dynamic which should be respected by all. And each social order determines its program for itself. That is what is uh, termed uh, national cultural autonomy, which is a cultural, you know, in a political sense, a national political autonomy as well. And in certain cases, this is, uh, should also mean territorial autonomy as in 